Dankeschön. Wow, wow, uh, that's uh, super nice. It's my first time here. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people on a Sunday afternoon, but shiny Sunday afternoon as well uh, at the Entrepreneurship Summit. Thank you so much, Professor Faltin, for uh, inviting. Is it better? You hear me well? Yes. Uh, and it's uh, a big pleasure for me to be to be here. I'm not. Uh, I I worked with Professor Yunus. I had the pleasure of traveling with him along. See this speech so many times. Every time something new comes along, so I'm not replacing him, it's impossible to replace him. So don't lower your expectations immediately, but uh, it is uh, really a pleasure for me to tell you the story and tell you how just giving dignity to people brought to a systemic change that we're happy to witness till today. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about the developments that happen in Bangladesh. Um, I hope you see it uh, well. Uh, let me put a premise. We talk about social business. Um, the Yunus concept of social business a bit re revolutionized a bit the way we see business in a way that it's not just anymore in terms of profit, but business can have a role in solving human problems, in solving environmental problems. So usually social business is always associated a bit to charity because we try to solve poverty, to give access to food, to water. Um, the vision that Professor Yunus had when he uh, started his work was that a charity dollar only has one life. That a social business dollar can be reinvested. It can be like over and over again, it can create and try industries, provide jobs, and change the lives of many. So. Uh, Usually, you know, when we talk about social businesses in Europe, in the US, uh, the challenge that we get is, okay, but we don't really have these big problems here. So social business can't really work, or it has to be wor working in a different way. That's why we have other forms, right? So what I'm gonna invite you to do today is to embrace this vision, just bring some messages that I'm gonna give you today and try to apply them to to, to where you live, to the problems that you see, which might be of different nature, but they're still problems, and we're seeing like a rise of different interconnected global problems. Uh, with the rise of technology can bring new problems. So try to think it, to, to see this with, with the mindset of what you're facing today. Um, my, I'm gonna take you on a journey where everything started, our work started, and I was uh, Bangladesh. Uh, how many of you have been to Bangladesh in the room? Okay, I do see some people who have been to Bangladesh. Um, the story starts in 1972. I was not born yet. Uh, I just studied it from uh, books, did my, also my master thesis uh, back in the days. But just to give you a bit of a background on Bangladesh, you might have heard it maybe uh, from, you might have re read, re like read, read it on your uh, t-shirts. A lot of our clothes are made in Bangladesh. Uh, you might have heard how an over, like a, a, it's a country with an extremely, um, with densely pop which is very densely populated. Uh, Bangladesh is a country that is almost half the size of uh, Germany, in between India and, uh, and China. It is a country that is very much affected by climate change. Uh, because of its specific position at the delta between three big rivers, and with the very wide coastlines, it is very much affected by floods, by, um, uh, by big storms, cyclones. And in, back in those days, in the 70s, it was a time in which Bangladesh was coming out of their independence from Pakistan. There were huge, um, huge, of course, like economic challenges. There had been a lot of big floods. So all of these systemic problems were really putting the country on the, on the break. Uh, there was a huge famine in 1974 that was killing millions of people. And professor Yunus at the time was an economics professor at the University of uh, uh, Chittagong. And he would say, you know, I was going to university every day, seeing literally people dying of hunger on the, on the street. And dying of hunger is a very slow death. So you would go day by day and see people dying. 
So I stopped using books. You know, as an economic professor, I felt that the system, the economics, was failing me. So I went out there into the villages and tried to really understand what the problem was. And it all started really by questioning, how is it possible that in a country with an incre a rising population, with like 35 million acres of, uh, of land, of agricultural land, people are dying of hunger. And he realized only 16% of those fields were actually used to produce food. Um, and there were a lot of like, uh, problems. So he started to sit with the farmers, like, why are you not using your fields? So I think there is like a, I don't understand if it's coming from, uh, from me. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and farmers would just laugh at you, like these economic professors sitting with them and asking them questions. Um, and then he started understanding, he started studying a bit the high yield um, rice varieties from the Philippines. He started checking, okay, what, why are, there are like 300 feet tube wells spread all over the country. Why are you not using them? There has been huge investments. There were problems, of course, also in the irrigation systems. These tube wells had been like, uh, um, constructed with huge investments, but the distribution systems, for example, they were not built. The farmers didn't know how to um, how to protect the plants, how to use fertilizers, there was a huge gap. So for the end time, it was uh, what we call a misguided development. So the government investing for the people, but without really understanding the people-centered problems around the technologies that were implemented. Uh, and this is seen so much in uh, sustainable in international development by when organizations go into the global south and start in investing there. So, it started, I have a, okay. It started, uh, sorry, just give me a moment. Okay. Better? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so, it started saying, okay, let, what we, can we do here? And uh, the first social business experiment was, was born. It was called the Nabajuk New Era 3 Share Farm. It was a very simple concept. It was uh, so the landowner would contribute their land, the sharecroppers would contribute their labor, and Professor Yunus, because like, the farmers didn't have enough money, he was contributing the money, he was buying the fertilizers, he was like, uh, building the irrigation system for them with, the, with his students, always with his students. Um, and he was contributing the know-how that he had learned without being an agronomist. Um, so they did this experiment, and then in exchange, each of the three parties would get one-third of the harvest. It was a success. Uh, but then Professor Yunus thought, okay, but is the problem solved? Okay, we see that we can work this way. But I, he could see that the landowner was getting richer and richer. He had a land, but there were people who didn't own a land, the labor, that were working 10 hours a day, especially there were these women in the corner always working 10 hours a day. Usually there were destitute women who had been widows, for example, who had been abandoned and they were trying to find cheap jobs, earning 40 cents per day, the whole day bending down, trying to divide the harvest rice from the dry straws, and they were not getting any better. They were like continuously in this like circle of poverty. So he realized the way international development was seeing the poor people, it was pretty much without making too many differences, but there's very different levels of poverty. The farmers were considered, of course, marginalized and like poor, they had a land, but there were a lot of people who didn't own a land. So we started studying those people and that's where the old concept of the Grameen Bank came from. So he, the first village he visited was the Jobra village, it's always around the University of the Chittagong. And he would go with his uh, female students because he wanted to talk to the women. The women were always secluded in their houses. In Bangladesh at the time, they were victims of huge um, cultural and like uh, um, traditional practices that saw them, you know, like as a mouth to feed. 
uh, that, you know, like you're born and you, you always consider like a weight. Your family is going to get indebted to pay for your dowry. So he wanted to understand why are they blocked in this circle of poverty. Um, one of the first uh, women he talked to was uh, Sophia Begum. She was 21 years old, had three kids, and uh, all day she was building these bamboo stools. Um, and so they started asking her questions like, uh, how do you do it? How do you, where do you get your bamboo? How does it work? She would get five taka, which is the amount of 22 dollar cents, from uh, a pie car, a loan shark. Then she would produce her bamboo stool and she would sell it for five taka 50. She would make a profit of 0.5 taka, that is around two cents. And then she would have to pay 10% interest to the loan shark. And this every day. So in, when, you see, when you hear this, you wonder, okay, then how can you, can you, you know, just block this circle of poverty? It's a continuous circle that goes on in the same life. So he said, okay, let's, let's make an experiment. He called his students. And he, he said, okay, tell me how many people in this village are doing the same? I want to know how, many, how much money are they lending, like, are they borrowing from these uh, pie cars? It was 40 people in the village for a total amount of $27. So it was like, okay, all of the, these people, they only need each around 20 cents. All of them in the village need $27. How, how comes that they cannot just go to a bank, you know? Naively, you're just like, I mean, it's easy, you know? Just land, like uh, getting such a small credit. And he did this, so he went to a bank. And, the, and he said, look, I need $27 as a loan to give to these people. And then the, the banker started laughing at him because it's like, I mean, this money is not even enough to pay for, you know, the documents, the bureaucracy that we have. And Professor Yunus was like, 75% of your population is illiterate in Bangladesh. Why do you even have documents in the first place? And the second point, so he was like, my students can fill their stupid documents, no problem. And then he was like, yeah, no, but it's not, that's not really the major issue. The major issue is these people don't have collateral. They don't have a guarantee, they have nothing. And then he was like, those people need to survive from day by day. They will be just, you know, motivated to give you that money back because they need it for the next, they need more for the next money, for the next day. So I don't understand your collateral concept. I will be the guarantor for these people. They took the loan, it was fully repaid, 98% of repayment rate, and this was the first experiment from which the Grameen Bank was, was born because he understood really this was a system that was making the poor poorer. It was not because the people didn't want to work. They wanted to work, but they couldn't get out of that system. So a model was built, and we always say the reason why the Grameen Bank was so successful until today is for sure, and today it lends to over 9 million women in Bangladesh, and we, I will show you some figures over, around the world. But uh, the reason why it's so successful is, first of all, we, we always say for his employees. Um, Professor Yunus would always hire very uh, young uh, people, fresh graduates, um, because they, did, they were not contaminated for the bank system. They, didn't, they had fresh ideas. They wanted to just create new models. They loved the adventure of creating this new model. And they would open branches then by themselves, year by year and testing with always small and small borrowers. So it grew at a sustainable uh, pace. And the other reason that we say uh, made this project so successful is because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model based on trust, based on trust. So it's based on the fact that people are honest, they will repay their, their money, and they will uh, reinvest it in a, in a way that can increase the the results and the benefits for not only themselves, but for the whole community. So it sees credit really as a human, as a human right. 
It has been contested in the, in the years. There were a lot of critiques because it might, you might think that creates, you know, then a, a process, a continuous, you know, flow uh, that you're constantly depending on this money. But um, I went to Bangladesh uh, last year. I visited the, the centers uh, because the way it's basically organized, you can't um, borrow money if you're not in a group. So women would organize themselves in groups. They get the loan together and they become self-accountant for their like, own uh, repayments. For example, if some person, one of the group has some problems, the other ones would support each other. Uh, so I went to, see, to meet some of the groups in, in Bangladesh last, uh, last year, and you could really see the, you could really read for, read, for example, on the reports how every week they go there, repay their, lo their like, uh, interest, uh, repay their loan, like every week they meet and they repay their loan since years and years and years. There were some of them, um, uh, they had, for example, built cinemas, and the, all their children, they had gone to school because they could pay for their children education afterwards. Um, and another aspect, interesting aspect is the saving accounts. Um, so basically not only, th these women are really mentored on increasing the revenues of their like, or, or income generating activities on how to improve their businesses. Um, and they're also trained to save money. So they create these huge saving accounts so in the, in the past, for example, if somebody needed had some urgencies, medical urgencies in the family, or for example, uh, there were some floods in the village, they had to rebuild in, entire houses. There was a huge saving account where people could get the money uh, and use it for their communities. This saving account in 1998 was uh, around $100 million. That's the same amount of basically among the biggest uh, organizations in, uh, in Bangladesh, like the, the worth of the biggest organization in Bangladesh. Just to, see, to show you how, like, uh, uh, what of a social and economic ex experiment and, like, success this, uh, this is still today. Um, I was laughing in that picture because uh, the, um, you could really see this proud, this pride in the, in the women that, were, that we, were seeing, we were visiting, like, oh, these people came all the way from Germany to, to be with us today and sitting in our circle, and they were asking us autographs. And I was like, sorry, I didn't get the Nobel Peace Prize. You, the Grameen Bank, and you borrowers got it because 97% of the Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers. So I was like, I want your autograph because I, you have the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so just like a little anecdote. Um, so yeah, we, we, we always say this was uh, really one of the biggest uh, women empowerment uh, uh, experiment and project that uh, today is, uh, is out there. And the reason why um, they asked like, themselves at the beginning, why should we go to men, to women? And they... Um, they could really see that, first of all, I mean, going to women was very hard because you were not going against only those uh, practices, those cultural uh, uh, barriers that were there. You had to really, like, uh, talking to them as well was super hard at the beginning. But when they were getting the credit, first they were always repaying back, and you could really measure the impact on the whole family. Because the first thought that comes to their, he their head is, I, will, uh, I need to feed my children. I need to provide education to my children. So the impact the, of, uh, that could be seen by giving credit to, to, the w to women was incredible. Um, one other aspect, of, so you, can, you, can, you, you see it was really like about giving dignity to the, the, the women. They felt so empowered the moment that they were like handling money that they never had handled before, um, that immediately like they started really getting active as communities. And this is uh, another example of how this model was really giving even more dignity to them and to the communities. Uh, there were 16 decisions that were created at the beginning. And these uh, decisions were really like uh, commitments that the women, the groups had to take to be joining the Grameen program. And these decisions were basically like, uh, I commit to be always accountable, transparent, 
I commit to, to work because like, I recognize the importance of work and of entrepreneurship in generating my own income uh, generating activities. Um, I recognize uh, the equality of genders. I recognize uh, the importance of uh, living in an hygienized place where they were really incentivized to build their own houses, like proper houses that were not destroyed by bad weather. They were incentivized to build like proper toilets. They were incentivized to bring the children to education and they had to commit to that. So it was not just a project, I give you the money and that's it, you're gonna just make your own money. It's I give you the money and I wanna make sure that you live like a dignified person and your whole community feels that same dignity. Um, we like to call it a human and life-centered model that really goes beyond financial empowerment. It really provides access to healthcare, education, to clean water technology. So the Grameen Bank soon became really this holistic support system. Eventually, you know, like there were different kind of uh, loans that were also created when they saw, for example, to build a house, they needed some loans. So they started creating like uh, house loans. There was a toilet loan to build your own toilet as well. But all of these like loans were created exactly to create this dignified support system. And that was the, not the end of the story. Around the Grameen Bank, um, Professor Yunus said we wanted to create a network of social businesses. So for every need that these women had, a social business was created uh, to provide healthcare, housing, and, uh, or different kind of technology phones. You might have learned about the Grameen phone ladies. Um, I, I wanted to share with you some of the examples, two examples. Uh, one is the, um, where we were here, like uh, in Grameen Shakti is a social business that provides um, solar panels. They have distributed over two million solar panels. And here you can see Grameen Kalyan is one of the most effective uh, clinic that I've ever seen. And like in two hours, people go there, receive their treatment, uh, they receive the results of their blood analysis, if there is a shortage of electricity, there is solar panels that are, make sure that people can continue operating. I'm, gonna, I'm happy to discuss about all of these afterwards uh, uh, with any of you. I just wanted to briefly give you a bit of numbers. Just the Grameen Trust was created to bring the Grameen Initiative everywhere in the world. Uh, today, it's present in over 45, 43 countries. Uh, over 25 million uh, members have been reached with loans, over 22 billion. Uh, dollars have been disbursed in microloans, 94% of that was repaid. Uh, this brings me to today. Uh, you might have heard what happened in Bangladesh in the past two months. And that's also the reason why Professor Yunus could not, could not be here today. Um, there was a different, uh, like always we see again the power of dignity of the people of Bangladesh and especially of the ordinary people, especially the youth. Who, were, who fought to request an inclusive and just democracy. So there were huge demonstrations that ended up into um, the fall of the government. Professor Yunus was called to be the interim prime minister by those same young people that he always supported in the years, whose mothers he supported through this model. So you see that systemic change continued until today. And this is, for me, the picture that really shows this power of dignity of a full nation. Um, we could stay forever talking about what are the next, uh, you know, challenges uh, happening. Professor Yunus would tell you, now turn back to, to Bangladesh. There's a big potential now to build uh, projects, opportunities. Um, it, would also, it would also say, say like, if you're asking yourself, okay, but what can we do? How can we make a similar change in our communities? Start with you, start small, and uh, invest in the, in the youth. So it's great that uh, this event is also happening at the Fly Universität. Um, and it grows with us, so with collective action. So we invite you to uh, reach out uh, to us as well. I will show you the contacts. I wanted to leave you with some words from Professor Yunus. Give me a moment. A 
So I'm talking about the present civilization. This is a civilization which is on the path of self-destruction. So it doesn't have a future left because of the problem that it has generated inside of it. This is the time to create a new civilization. We have to change the parameters of this present civilization. Like uh, one parameter is uh, people are selfish. And that's what the whole civilization is built on. I said, that's wrong. That's a distorted interpretation of human being. Human beings are selfish and selfless. So that selfless part is completely forgotten. So in the new civilization, we reinterpret human being closer to what real human beings are, selfish and selfless. There'll be selfish businesses like we do today. There'll be selfless businesses which you want to do today, which is businesses to solve human problems. I always insist that poverty doesn't belong to human being. It's an artificially imposed on human being because the system is designed that way. It's not the fault of the persons, it's the fault of the system. So if you're looking for getting people out of poverty, don't look at the people who are poor. Look at ourselves who created the system. We are responsible for creating that poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those authentic uh, yeah, insights into your work and also Professor Yunus' work. Uh, there are a few questions here already on uh, Slido. I can only ask one question and I ask you to give a very short answer. Yes. Um, but you will have also have a panel with Peter Spiegel later, so um, you can discuss more questions later. So my question here, or the question from the crowd is, do you have any ideas on how to create systematic change so that newly created businesses do not, do not feed into in just in systems so that newly created businesses do i think there's a mis feed into in just systems yes um the um, so whenever we for example start our program we accompany our entrepreneurs in creating the social businesses we always run uh, systemic thinking workshops so to really analyze systems, analyze stakeholders, analyze the relationships within the different stakeholders, understand the cause and relationships of uh, different elements. So you, usually that's the first step we, we take. And whenever then like people go in design thinking uh, steps to create their social businesses, we always re revisit that system. And now is that system changing? Um, we need the, the, the first the question that really comes immediately to my mind is ask a lot of questions challenge anything that comes to your mind that uh, gets proposed to you. Uh, and don't be, sometimes we're a bit biased, so we don't see those injustices because we don't leave them on ourselves. So always try to challenge also your beliefs in, uh, when you're creating a business. Thank you, thank you very much. And yeah, ho hopefully you will see lots of, your, um, lots of those people thank here you. in your workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie.